Hello and welcome to another edition of Storyophonic, a regular conversation series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. Please take a moment and rate us or give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. You can follow us at Storyophonic.com as well as on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Now let's meet the host of Storyophonic, Dan Campbell. Two superbly accomplished songwriters join us today. Pam Shane is probably best known for Genie in a Bottle, the breakthrough hit for Christina Aguilera, but she has thousands of additional credits with recording artists and songs for network television shows. I think, you know, when you get a group of people in the room, you somehow, hopefully, <laughs> if you have chemistry, get on the same track and, and you, tr- you, you trust. And it's all about trusting somebody and going with their idea because they really believe in it. And speaking of songs, probably right now, somewhere in this world, a Richard Harris song is playing on a television show, a feature film, or a national advertising spot. Chemistry, as you say, is everything. You know, we've all worked with talented writers and the chemistry wasn't there and the song came out absolutely terrible. I mean, sometimes, the, you know, chemistry can also be that yin and yang and that push and pull, you know, as much as being, we're all agreeing on everything, but chemistry is, is so much a part of it. The two recently teamed up for songwriting camps, mentoring and educating the next generation of creators. Meet Pam Shane and Richard Harris, Two dedicated professionals succeeding big time in this demanding and ever-shifting business of music. In studio with us today, songwriter, producer, many things. Pam Shane (laughs) is with us, joined by Richard Harris, also a songwriter, very Big in the film, television, international market, also produces as well yeah. as does Pam. So both of you do a number of things. Nice to have you here. Good morning. Dan. Pam, I've interviewed you a number of times, and there's a section on you in a book that I co-wrote with Don Grierson called right. It All Begins with the Music. That's you did right. a really nice section. Of course, I have that in Thank front you. of me today. Richard, I've been with you socially. I yes. guess that's what we could call it, uh, <laughs> although we've never had an opportunity to do an interview, but today we'll change all of that. Welcome to the studio. Well, thank, thank you, you for having us. That's Good great. morning. That's great. I'd like to start in the present. Richard is decked out today, and he's wearing a Songwriter Camps t-shirt, so I'd like am. to talk about that. Um, mentorship has been traditionally a part of your experience. Yeah. You, in combination with Pam, now have the songwriter camps where you are mentoring songwriters, and it's sort of like a retreat kind of a situation. Explain that to us a little bit. Yeah, and I, just let me give you some background on it, really. We, Pam and I have obviously known each other for, for well, maybe not obviously to the listeners, but um, we've known each other for quite some time. We, we met 10 years ago at actually another conference, actually, the Hawaii Songwriters Festival. Yes. It was the yeah. Kauai Songwriters Festival at the time. And um, and Pam and I have been mentoring over the years and and uh, doing lots of festivals and expos and and I think we kind of saw a, a gap in what was happening for the for the artists and the writers that were coming to these events um, because they were presenting well packaged CDs with wonderful photographs yeah. and. Everything had been done right there, but th- when you got to listen, to, and that was a big moment for them, and they were presenting their songs to A&R and publishers and, and whoever, and there was a small element missing, and sometimes that was a chorus and a good concept and a great lyric and a great melody. And we and it could have been produced very, very well, you know, but um, so we, we saw that really there was a need for a songwriting retreat-type experience for writers to learn from experienced professionals that were still in the game, that were still writing, and uh, and give them the kind of tools they need to write better songs so that when they went to these events, that one shot or maybe their first or second shot, they would have a chance to present a song that was ready to be presented to the, to the publishers, the A&R, and their success rate would then obviously go up. So Pam and I got talking about it, and it took about 18 months for us to pull the whole mm-hmm. thing together. Um, and the experience is a, it's a three-day, uh, four-day, three-night immersive experience where they're with us pretty much from the 
moment they wake up yeah. and they've showered, of course, and they <laughs> they're, and they're, because we, we, we share we share meals together. <laughs> And um, and we take them through master classes, songwriting collaborations, and performances in the evening. So um, so yeah, it's uh, that's basically it in a nutshell, really. Yeah, it's it's a really fun experience, and uh, we do it in a pretty nice uh, venue in Palm Springs. Yes, at the Ace Hotel. So it's kind of a a little mini vacation, come uh, songwriting workshop. Yeah. It's, it's interesting what you mentioned, uh, Richard, the phenomenon sometimes when people want to get critiques with material, but there's no, you can't critique it because it's completely done. It's all done. Yeah. And sometimes people who operate outside of uh, kind of the geographic realities that we have here yeah. uh, in Los Angeles of uh, being around the industry, um, sometimes will create something which, which isn't really industry standard. And, and it, oh, my dear, they pay so much money to do it sometimes, these projects. Well, this is it. I think yeah. a lot of that is there's, there's so much investment of money. And it is hard because we've been on the receiving end of that where you actually have to tell somebody that the song is just not ready and the production isn't right because it's not saying anything about the song or the artist. There's no cohesiveness there, you know. And, uh, and it's difficult, but, you know, sometimes what you're doing is giving them advice for the next time around. Sure. You know, it's okay, you're not going to go back and tear this to shreds, but, you know, you, you could. there's some ideas here. There's a learning and a teachable moment here which will help them the next time around, you know. And, and really that's what Songwriter Camps is trying to do is put that into a, a, a three-day intensive situation that they get as much information like that as they can get you know pam what do you wish people had told you when you were coming up what information can you now share that you wish you had had i wish i had a mentor a creative mentor. Yeah. I had um, some great publishers mm -hmm. who were more involved in the creative feedback, which was great. Um, and my husband who managed me. Yes. Um, he was always sometimes a little harsh. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, I think people, like anything, you need further education on any craft, mm -hmm. I think, I believe. And... Um, this is just an opportunity for someone to learn a bit more about digging into the weeds of songwriting. Speaking from the heart, but also taking some new techniques and formulas that there are around. I think sometimes songwriters, are so they get so caught up in their little world, which is their room that they write in, that they, they kind of get lost and disconnected from their community as well. And, and sometimes it's a shortcut yeah. way of just saying, you're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to write bad songs because you're just clearing out the pipe. You're just allowing those good songs to come through. And I think there's a, there's a number of things. Obviously, the, we teach a lot about craft. We also encourage them to encourage their creative energy and their creative spark in the first place, not to kill that off with craft, to let these ideas come out and it's little things like that where they, because you get so wrapped up in your own head as a writer sometimes, and we all have done it. It's it's a nice to be able to say to me, you're allowed to do these things. You're allowed to say something terrible in a room because that's you need to be allowed to actually just get your ideas out there without critique, without judgment, so that the next idea that you would have, which is sitting behind that bad idea, is the one that everybody's been waiting to hear in the room at the time. You know? It's actually quite amazing how many songwriters don't collaborate as well. I was going to say that, And yeah. um, that's something that we focus on a lot. I think it's super important. In my career, I've learned so much from writing with other people. You know, I believe you, you learn something from everyone you write with, even if it wasn't the greatest experience. Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot about collaboration and some of the sort of unspoken laws of collaboration. Yeah, it's been really great to see people... Uh, flower. I flower, think. Yeah. yeah, and still stay in touch. We have people writing together all the time that came to the camp. You know, we've had a, a, a recent success. Well, you can explain that one, Pam, with The Shanae. one in Romania? Yeah. Yeah, we have had a lot of attendees come from different <laughs> places in the world. An artist in Romania, Ovi Jacobson, came to our camp and he had been involved in writing for Romania in the Eurovision Song Contest. So um, he was writing it again this year, putting a song into it, and asked Shani Rose... Yeah 
to write it with him the day after the camp and they got into the finals. Sadly, they didn't win, but they got into the finals and were on TV. And, and the song is actually getting tons really of radio play over there mm-hmm. right now. Doing so, very well. Yeah, yeah. So, so those small little successes are great. That's cool. This has come up before in interviews. Um, I know about Eurovision mm. and, and how massive that is, but we don't have anything equivalent here in the U.S., so it's no. kind of difficult to explain to people. And I'm surprised you know. the, the U.S. hasn't joined in, because it's not really Europe, is it? It's no. called Eurovision, but Israel are involved. Yes. I think Australia was in yeah, the Yeah, uh-huh. so I think it's it's open to all comers, really. Yeah. I think if you have somebody that has a European background, you possibly can just go. But Celine sang yes. for France, for France. Yeah. and Correct. ABBA mm-hmm. were there um, yep. with Waterloo, which which was obviously the winner that year. Yeah. So, you know, there's I've been some uh, taken part a couple of times in the Eurovision right. when I was based in the UK yeah. and sang backing vocals with uh, Sonia. All yeah. oh, right. <laughs> nice. Oh, my uh, Lord. Years ago. Yeah. And my dad actually was with Lulu at the time, and Lulu did Boom Bang a Bang, and my dad was ah. the conductor for that. Oh, my God. And I still have his Eurovision medal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's so cool. Can you speak an unspoken rule of collaboration for us, Pam Shane? Because you sure. kind of got me intrigued when you, okay, said that, okay. when you said that. Try not to talk down somebody else's idea until you have a better idea. Nice. Because if you don't have something to replace it with, then... That can just be a placeholder in any case. It's hard to say, hey, I, I think that idea sucks or yeah. that's not it, but if you don't have if anything, you don't have anything to it. replace it. Yeah. Got yeah. It. One of the other good ones is the most important person in the room is the song, not the people in the room. Yeah. That's We're great. all working for the benefit of the the song, not for everybody else's egos and ideas. You know, we're all here to make the song as good as we possibly can. So, and that's hard sometimes. Oh yeah, of that's, course. Yeah, and you've you know. got you've got to be able to fight for ideas as well uh, when you know you think it has something. Um, but also, you you've got to be careful not to shut other people down because we've all been in that room and how it feels. It's a very know? fine balance. One of the things the Nashville writers have told me is that the youngest writer is supposed to bring in the idea. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I, I've, I've always experienced found that. that. Have you? Have you? Oh yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you got? What do you got, son? Yeah. Except nobody told me that. <laughs> I found out the hard way. Yeah. 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 I find that what very you got for me. What do you got for me? Especially in that realm in Nashville, which is very much a song town. Sure. And that's always something that we talk about with songwriters here because we're in Los Angeles, which is not a song town. Los Angeles is a project town. Right. Um, hmm. package town, you know. So it's song in service of many times artists. And Pam, you've really remarkably, you know, you work with, you know, a Camilla uh, Cabello and artists that are very much new and emerging kinds of artists as well, correct? That was a lucky one. I didn't actually get in the room with Camilla. Uh-huh. Um, I think what happened was Sia wrote the song with a few other people and used the, the melody from Genie in a Bottle, uh-huh. the pre-chorus melody. I'm not sure whether she did it purposely or whether it was an accident. I'm not sure, but they came to us after the after the event and, um, you know, offered us a percentage. Good. We had a similar situation uh, with Shelley Pike and, yes, of course, yeah. and Dwell, so yeah, no, who's Shelley been our really guest. Well. So, well, that's a beautiful thing. It was it? a beautiful thing. Like and you see the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. It's amazing. The, the life of a pop song, especially a pop song like Genie in a Bottle. I mean, you know, it's difficult to translate that into words. There is a duration. There's a life to that song that it can, continues, right? Yeah. It's incredible. Very, yeah. I'm very grateful. Incredible. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew Who that knew? day in Topanga Canyon? <laughs> Who knew? Amazing. David Frank and Steve Kidman yeah. very famously. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Still in touch. Thank you yeah. for the genie in a bottle. Thank yeah. you. Yes. On the international side, Richard, you know, when I look at your credits, you you are really a world guy. Some reason that seems to be my my, my <laughs> yeah, mo. That's your thing. It's a good thing. My very first cut well, actually was with Catherine McPhee yeah. in the U.S. and and it was a solo write as well, which was hilarious because they just don't happen very often these days. You know, there's always at least twenty five writers on a song, but <laughs> um, but when Pam and I worked together on a on, on a song, and um, and that was probably my first big international hit which was a song called lighthouse and uh we we wrote with jeff franzel a good friend of ours and i've just been developing relationships because i'm signed to peer publishing they have offices all over the world and i just got lucky 
I suppose, by developing relationships with each of the offices, really. And, uh, and that's resulted in me being able to pitch songs to, to China and Japan. That's and, not lucky. That's Well, that's working. work, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I think, you know, what is it? Uh, hard work and opportunity is what luck means or something like that. <laughs> um, when hard work meets opportunity, yeah. that's where luck lives. And I think um, it's becoming a, increasingly difficult to pitch songs in L.A., you know, because of the way the business works right now. And uh, so I didn't take that as a negative. I took that, took that as an opportunity to explore other markets and just see where I could get my music into those markets and develop those relationships. And, and it's paid off, you know, so yeah. I've been very fortunate. The other reality, of course, is for both of you is songs for television shows. Right. And feature films yep. and advertising. Yep. So, yeah. Richard, you sort of like bumbled into that reality in a way. Well, right? I, in a in a way, yeah. Again, it's just you know, I never took no for an answer in in my life. To be honest with you, I've been very fortunate because my father's um, my father has been a, an amazing mentor in just in terms of his life experience, and he's had an amazing career in in music. And um, but my dad never stood still, you know, and despite age and complications, but. He, uh, he just continues to work and find opportunities where they, they might be. And the television film thing just, you know, it just seemed to be... An, I mean, obviously, people talk about film and television sync all the time. Sure. But for me, it was a, a case of just, okay, here's some things that uh, um, I can be doing better. So I started to focus my skills set into that area. Because it is, takes a different kind of writing, to be honest with you, in, if you're going to pitch songs... And it doesn't mean you kind of make the songs just sync friendly. They still have to have artistic merit and all those things. So there's a balancing act there. Um, but it's, again, it's paying off. And uh, I've been very fortunate through some associations with other publishers like Secret Road mm -hmm. that pulled me in on, a, on a, a wonderful songwriting immersive, which happens in Hawaii. And, uh, and that bared fruit and showed me the way. And I could see I had a skill set there that I hadn't really, you know, worked up and and it continues to pay off thank god <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's I mean, you watch television you have to understand what what the function of the music is within a specific show correct? absolutely and the nuances as well yeah. and in terms of lyrical content sometimes because there are certain no-nos in terms of you know film and television you know lyric writing you have to be a little bit more ambiguous in terms of your descriptives you know so um people's names place names things like that. right specificity yeah. doesn't work totally and that's a camp we're going to do in october october yeah songwriter camps is um, same venue in palm springs uh, -huh. uh we're going to be doing a four day four night five day event, um yeah. event um focusing on um writing for sync yeah so we'll do a day on film we'll do a day on uh tv um trailer Mm -hmm. and, commercials. and commercials yeah great great i tend to watch television with tune find open right. so i can see what i'm hearing sometimes oh, you know cool. yeah i was doing it last night i was watching world of dance and i had tune find open so i could see actually what the choices were and that it's even like bumper music they tell you i mean it's all that information it's fun that. it's fun to see yeah you know and there's some amazing artists that do very well in that space and you've never heard of on the radio yeah you know yeah. And yeah. they're having wonderful careers, you know. And have emerged through that. You mentioned Secret Road. You yeah. know, Ingrid Michaelson obviously yeah, came up that way. Yeah. Um, Carrie Kimmel, who's been our guest here. Right. Uh, you right. know, that's a, that's, that's a big thing for her. Sure. So it's, it's terrific that amount of integrity can be embraced, you know, within that format. Oh, absolutely. You know? And I yeah. think music supervisors are doing a wonderful job of supporting independent artists, you know. Yes. And if they get on, you know, and some of them really do champion some amazing artists and find them early and help them along. And I think that's, an, that's a wonderful thing because it's certainly lacking in certain other areas of the industry, you know. Sure. You know. The relationship with music supervisors, it's very interesting. I know that you met and meet music supervisors one-on-one -on -one sure. in personal relationship kind of a thing as yeah. opposed to just being some something you're pitching to. Yeah. You actually know them, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I mean, I know a lot of music supervisors I've met, not only on a professional level, but just because we're at the same events together, you know, mm -hmm. like the Durango Songwriters Expo and West Coast Songwriters. There's a whole bunch. And most of the time, we're just making friends with each other. And sometimes it just nothing comes of it because the music I'm doing doesn't fit a lot of the things that they're doing. 
But, you know, a case in point, the other day I got an email from, a, and, and I'll the, leave the music supervisor's name out of it, but she emailed me and said, hey, I'm working on this show. Are you interested in doing something for it? And I said, absolutely. And now we must have known each other for probably eight years. Yeah. And this is the very first time we've ever got to work professionally on something. And it's probably the lesson is, you know, just build you relationships with yeah. people. Sure. Don't expect something out of every single relationship because you when shouldn't. It it's half of these people. They're just great to hang out with, yeah. you know, and, and we, we share a passion, which is music a lot of and the time. And when it right? happens organically, that's yeah, so that's much the best, nicer. Best yeah. Play. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I've, I've had music supervisors say, you know, have a relationship with me before you pitch me or, you know, know who I am as a human being. Sure. Yeah. There's always that issue of, you know, treating people like people. Yeah. Uh, treating them as, and, and looking at what we have in common with all music people. Yeah. Which is, you know, we're in this because we love music. Absolutely yeah. right. And they might tell you something that will change your life and it doesn't necessarily have to be something to do with a business relationship with them. Yeah. It might be just something that they're saying, you go... I've never heard it said that way. That's something I need to take on board, you know. And the degree of knowledge that many of them have is oh. just astonishing. Astonishing. They yeah. work so hard. They do. Yeah. It's a hard gig. Yeah. It's a hard gig, Cause especially TV, because it's all very instant. Yeah. We need it. We got to clear it today, you know, because we're going to air it tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So many times. Can you write under that kind of pressure? Can either of you write under like incredible pressure if something has to happen? Yeah. You have the ability I've to done do that. it. Yeah, plenty of times. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where when you've sharpened that sword enough, there are certain things that you know will inspire you quickly and get you into that headspace quicker. And I think that's part of it. You know, when you're first starting out, you just wait for inspiration to come along and you sit around and contemplate it's the world. experience that you, yeah. Yeah, and then there's times when you go, okay, I know what I need to do to kind of get myself going here. And you just turn on that tap and out it flows. Hopefully. Interesting. Are there rituals, Pam? Do you have rituals that you do to prepare yourself for the song? <laughs> that you can talk about the publicly. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, you can talk. I'm not sure, Dan. <laughs> not really. Not no. really. I like to exercise in the morning, have a nice big coffee. <laughs> do you right? Yeah. Get outside for a minute, uh, at least. Um, not really. I sort of, you know, I, think... I go to my space. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, my, my studio. I've got a studio at home. And um, I like to set up in there and uh, with my coffee and my collaborator and we have a chat and then get going. Cool. cool. I find music is probably the best inspiration for me a lot of the time. Yes. Just listening, just turning on something that really kicks, the, gets me going. And then I know I'm kind of feeling my in my place. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, th I, I think briefs are really important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, reference tracks. Sure. Ah, for so sure. Yeah. Tell you, so in other words, to tell you something along the lines of. Yeah. yeah. I, we're working with an artist tomorrow yeah. uh, together. And, um, you know, I think I, that's what I always ask for. I yeah. ask for reference tracks, the kind of thing they're looking for, the kind of songs they like. Um, obviously, you know, it's got to be authentic to them. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, whatever the lyric is about has got to come from the heart. So it's um, trying to pull all those things in to, um, you know, make a great, a great song come alive. Yeah. I've interviewed songwriters that say it comes out of a conversation sometimes. The mm -hmm. song will come out of a conversation with the artist and what they're experiencing in their lives. Yeah. And then how do you translate it that into lyrics? Yeah. Not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy no. thing to do. Uh, and often, you know, we've started an idea and gone along the line and something else has been said and it's like, that is it. That's and you've changed track. So, and those are the ideas that you should be writing, the ones that you really punch the air about and are special, a different angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. And I think those conversations are so important in the beginning because it's like speed dating, really. I know Shelley talks about that a lot, yeah. you know. You just meet somebody for the first time and you're expected to open up about something really super personal. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, knowing that you're in that safe environment, and that's again comes with experience with experienced writers and some young writers obviously as well, is knowing that you have that safe space to talk to, to each other about something that's super personal and 
and that's what gets the juices going, you know. You don't always have the time, though, and that's that's um, that happens a lot where you've only got a day with somebody yeah. and you have to, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat and um, you just get sort of used to um, f- finding a balance, you know, with um, – a great idea or an idea that is something that you can maybe polish afterwards. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you have to like, you're creating a track sometimes at the same time as sure. well, you know, yeah. so there's, there needs to be a reference track and sure. all of those things. You yeah. Know? So I, sometimes I ask songwriters, especially with certain types of music, yeah. where this line is between production and writing, mm-hmm. you know, because sometimes it, it seems like it's a, it's a little ambiguous. What is actually production? What is songwriting? You know, at the end of the day, I come from a school that's been crossed boundaries over the years, yeah. you know. Sat and wrote a lot of songs on a piano. Sat and wrote a lot of songs on a guitar. And I've sat and wrote a whole bunch of songs on a laptop mm-hmm. and a computer. And every situation is different. It's so difficult to put something into a box and say, well, that's production, that's not writing. I think if you're producing something that inspires another writer in the room to write something... That's part of the writing process as far as I'm set. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, production for me is not an afterthought. I tend to not sit there with headphones on producing a track while I'm leaving everybody else to do essentially the top line, which is the melody Mm -hmm. and the the, the lyric. I want to get involved in that part too because that's really kind of where I started. So um, I will do a lot of the production after everybody's left. You know, I will build a basic track and there will be chords and harmony for people to write over. But I don't want to be stuck there with a set of headphones on with my back to everybody, you know, carving out a brand new snare sound that's taken me three <laughs> hours to find. You know, I think, but I think it's very, you have to be very careful in terms of what you decide. And I think, again, it comes down to a lot of these things is sometimes you're, you'll be that writer in a room and you might be a, predominantly a lyricist, but you're not doing a lot of the lyric because you're just not having your day, you mm-hmm. know, but you're throwing in ideas, you're encouraging other people. And that is also writing as far as i'm concerned you're bringing out ideas from other people talking to them supporting their ideas going okay what do you mean by that i get what then why did you maybe you should think about it this way you're not writing the actual lyric but you're actually helping shape the 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 tone of the lyric and also the melody maybe as well so it's can be a little bit ambiguous really i suppose but um that's it's how where I the ins- it. go where the inspiration is yeah. you know whether that is a a track or a few chords or yep. a title, you know. Um, I think, you know, when you get a group of people in the room, you you somehow, um, hopefully, <laughs> if you have chemistry, <laughs> get on the same track and, and you, tr- you, you trust. And it's all about trusting somebody and going with their idea because they really believe in it. And uh, yeah. you said this earlier, Rich, about... Um, you know, fighting for an idea. Um, I think you learn that. The more you write, you learn, no, this is great. we got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and chemistry, as you say, is everything. You know, we've all worked with talented writers and the chemistry wasn't there and the song came out absolutely terrible. I mean, sometimes, the, you know, you, chemistry can also be that yin and yang and that push and pull, you know, yeah. as much as being mm-hmm. we're all agreeing on everything. But chemistry is, is so much a part of it, you know. Yeah. Should get a credit on every single song. <laughs> <laughs> and the fourth writer is chemistry. <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> Do you spend a lot of time listening to what's out right currently or sure. is that is that a part of, of your process? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I'm continually looking for new music because I'm I, I just want to get inspired by people's ideas. I think I listen to a lot of my old records, but that's because I just want to get locked into the emotions and the things I felt back then when I listened to those records, but I don't get stuck in them. I don't think, well, that's it. And that's what I listen to. I love to listen to new music because I want to feel something like I did when I first listened to those records I listened to when I was a kid, you know, I want to be pushed and pulled and, and shown a different way of doing things. I get inspired by voices and, um, I was doing a mentoring session on, Thursday, I think, last Thursday. And the artist played me a song of the, a group that I'd never heard of, Third Story. Mm-hmm. I had never heard their music. And 
I was so blown away by the song. I also found another version of it with a featured artist. And I love having those go-to songs that just lift you up. And I like to listen when I'm cooking as well, which is (laughs) (laughs) blaring music out of the kitchen while I'm cooking. It's rare that you find a song or an artist that just blows you away so much that Mm -hmm. you just want to play it over and over and over again. I've got two right now. Have you? Yeah, yeah. High High as Kite was is one of my on repeats right now. They have a new record out, right? And the new record by Seagreed is absolutely amazing. Oh yeah, you love her. I love her. (laughs) Nice. As our listeners have probably detected from your speaking, I, I was going to explain this just in case they wondered why, where you're from. Uh, I, I was going to explain that to them. So, so Pam, Pam, you were born in New Zealand, My raised in the UK, yeah. raised in the UK, and and Richard, you're from the UK. From the UK. Yeah. But so the the, the influx of, of of people from the UK. What was it about Los Angeles that made you want to be here? Well, I, I've been coming back and forth um, to L.A. Actually, I wasn't raised in ah. in the U.K. I left um, as a teenager okay. out, of, out of high school and went to London, uh, spent 28 years there. Wow. Was a singer first then got into writing, but came over back and forth to L.A. for quite a few years before we decided to come live here. And um, I feel I should have moved here probably 10 years before. Yeah. Uh, when I was having my success, my big success, but I wasn't ready because uh, we had a child and um, I wasn't sure whether with uh, everything going on with guns and stuff, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to bring up my child in, in America, but um, we went for it 10 years ago and, and I'm really glad we did. I love living here. Nice. How about you, Richard? What was your decision? A complete collapse of everything that was going on around me when I was in the UK, (laughs) to be honest with you. (laughs) My dad moved here when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And I was backwards and forwards. Every summer vacation, I would come out. I was My dad was with Paul Anker at the time. So I'd go on the road with my dad for like three or four weeks at a time in the summer. And I loved the States. Absolutely. My dad always kept saying, you know, you should move here. And um, when I was out of high school, I just didn't feel a pull. There wasn't enough strong enough pull. I'd built a studio in London and uh, I was in a band there. And, and then we came here, my band came here to play a few shows, uh, to do some showcasing for Electra Records and Hollywood Records. And we got some positive response, but we were told we needed to move here. And the band was pretty much at the end of its demise at that point. And it all just collapsed like a bad, you know, like a flan in a cupboard as Eddie, Iz- Eddie Izzard would say. And um, so then I broke up with my girlfriend. My recording studio was suffering a bit. And I thought, you know what? This Everything's pointing towards a restart. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that trip that we did with the band, I had a, a kind of like change of heart in terms of I thought, you know what? There's something here for me. I'm not sure what it is, but I've got to find out what that is. And uh, so I, I basically just picked up my tools and just got on a plane and slept on my sister's couch for a while and and started again really just hit the reset button as a writer I'd kind of stopped the idea of being an artist and I thought I'm just going to write and produce and and that's that's why I came that's something that you both have in common is of course you know having the background as an artist and I think that probably really allows you access to the artist you know mentality when mm-hmm. you work with recording for artists, sure right you know? yeah that's a big thing. Yeah, Pam, you you weren't living here when I first interviewed you. I mean, we recalled it was at the Sunset Marquee. That's it was right. out by the by the swimming yes. pool, the Sunset Marquee. Oh my gosh, I don't yeah. know how many years ago that was. It was a while. I remember it was a while, but I do remember. I remember it very well because I remember the way that the pool looked at night, and I thought, oh, this is this is very. LA is a very sexy city to live in. It's very yeah. seductive. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I made the move. I really am. I think it's. Uh, the center of the songwriting world. Yeah, yeah, then definitely. This in Nashville. World. Definitely yeah. Pop world. yeah, Richard. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier that I, I've been to a lot of conferences with you. Yeah. I've, I've been to I've been I've been to Kauai, yeah. you know, and the Kauai Music Festival thing. Um, and I, I recall being at Durango uh, Songwriters Conference, meeting a, a high school student from Maine. 
um, she was more in the writer side of things, and she mm-hmm. was still in high school, and she was going to a lot of conferences. And I know you encountered her and worked with her as well as Megan Trainer. Oh yes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, well, Megan was just you know a your powerhouse from the get go. Yeah, I, and I found I've I've got so many of her CDs from that back then that she would send me. And she was just the sweetest. And her dad, Gary, is just the nicest human as well. And, um, and I don't you know, I just struck up a rapport with Megan. And, and she was, I, I still have emails from her because I save every email from everybody. Is with, I should remember that. Yeah, no, I do. I, <laughs> I archive everything. Because I don't want to, I, I just, because I, I, I don't want my brain to be filled up with it all so sure. I can reference back to it. And, um, and she would send me these songs, and I, you know, it'd be like, "Hi, Richard. You know, I've I've written this one. I think it's kind of like something Rihanna would do." And I would play it, and it was like, "Absolutely, that's exactly what Rihanna would do." And it was all there. I mean, she just was fantastically talented from such an early age, and a great producer as well. She was great at producing tracks. So yeah, I, I was not shocked. When you know Gary came to me in a bar in Colorado, I think it was at Durango, <laughs> and said she's you know big yellow dog are offering her this publishing deal, and she was thinking of going to college. And what do you think? And I was like, well, well, okay. So I don't think this is really my remit. You're her dad, but anyway, look, the college thing will always be there. Yes, there's not always going to be a publishing deal. Yes, you should take that publishing deal and run with it because she's so talented. And of course, the rest is history. You know, she's. She's done very well for herself, that young lady. Did you see her as an artist? Did you did, did you was, did that come as a surprise? I mean, obviously, we knew her as a writer initially. Yeah, and she was she had a great voice. And I'd be honest with you, in the beginning, I didn't um, not the artist that she became. Yeah. To be honest with you, because it was very singer songwriter, you know, kind of approach. And um, and but there was a moment, and I and I don't think I've ever told this story. Her, she was. It was the, probably the last Durango I saw her at. And her dad had l- allowed her a pass for that night to go and hang with all the the, uh, people, the writers and other attendees in all the bedrooms, you know, because there would, would be like 20 people in a room playing songs. How old was she? I don't know, probably 17, yeah, I would right. think. Yeah. And uh, Gary said, make sure she doesn't get in into any trouble. And I said, well, of course, don't worry. She, and she won't because she's a sensible girl. And... Um, she, we were walking back to go somewhere and it was me, her, I think Warren Sellers and who was another wonderful writer and mentor and another guy. And, um, and he was kind of, uh, kind of pushing Megan a bit about something. She said, give me that guitar. And it was right by the elevator. <laughs> she sat down and she sang a song and I, then I saw something. It was like, oh, there's, there's something magical going on here, apart from the great writing and everything that she had down in spades, you know. Um, there was something there, but uh, I, I didn't see I didn't see the artist that she became. I've got to be honest, you know, because it just, it was just, I think it just flowers, you know what I yeah. mean? She's become this amazing artist. What's interesting, and I, you know, as you all are mentors and you have the songwriter camps, I think always to emphasize, and I'm sure that you do, there is brilliance around us at all times. Mm-hmm. There are people ascending, ascending around us at all times, just because they're not at that situation, you know. So, somebody might want to, you know, write songs with Megan Trainer. Well, you know, you're going to need to go back in time and get in on the ground floor mm-hmm. of a lot of these situations, yeah. you know. Because I get to interview artists that are in those situations all the time. I think of somebody like BB Rexa, who is right. very yes. big now. Is she? You know, she was a girl whose family couldn't afford to send her to Grammy camp. You know, so like there's a point at which you can access oh these careers. I mean, I have very few regrets in my life, but not writing with Megan is definitely one of them. Uh-huh. And I have still have texts and emails backwards and forwards where we were trying to figure out a time mm-hmm. and neither of us could make it work. And that was way before All About That Bass came out, you yeah. know. So, yeah, no, I would have loved to, the opportunity to have written with her back then. Not because of just the success, but I just thought she was a, yeah. such a talented writer and it would have been a fun day in the room for sure, you know. Yeah, yeah. So what, what other kind of realities do you stress about the songwriting life, Pam Shane, when you're doing the songwriter camps? Like, 
you know, I mean, this is a very reality-based stress situation. About? I mean, would you do you not? I don't mean you stress, but do you points that you make that people really need to know if they're oh, going I to see what yes, mean. if they're right. going to go into this world. Although it is a stressful job, it is a stress- <laughs> 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 Looking at your royalty check. Yeah, yeah well, that can be stressful. <laughs> well, we won't go there right yeah. now. No. <laughs> um, I would say you have to have a really thick skin to do what we do because I would say a lot of it is rejection, a lot more rejection in this sort of game than there is perhaps positives. Well, it's a very opinionated, very opinion-based opinion. yeah. business, you know. Everyone's got one. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> I would count myself as a pretty sensitive person Mm -hmm. and, um, God, if I can survive it, anyone can, you know, you just have to learn to grow a thick skin. Mm -hmm. And maintain that soft core, you know, you still, you have to, and that's the, that's the dichotomy of it really is that you have to build up this barrier to, to not think every song you write is your firstborn child, you know, it's uh, the son of God. (laughs) <laughs> it is you have to let them go out into the world. You yeah. know what I mean? And be that as it may, some will fall and stumble. Some will end up in rehab and the others will end up being a CEO <laughs> of a wonderful company. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, you can't, you, you still have to be able to connect to that soft part of your center, which is where you feel everything. You can't, you can't harden that part because if you do, you won't be able to write songs yeah. anymore. You have to be honest and genuine. And I say a lot to young artists as well. Find your, you know, your place in this world and plant your flag in the ground and stand by it because it makes it so much easier for you to then go, thank you for your opinion, but that's not yeah. how I see it. You know, you can take advice and you can, and, and especially advice that gets repetitive, which is like, that hasn't got a chorus, that hasn't got a chorus from 28 people. You should probably pay attention that that song probably doesn't have a chorus or a hook, you know. But you It's know, a really good point to make because I think you can take opinions to heart sometimes and they can crush you. Mm. I know when I was trying to get a, a deal when I was an artist in the UK, I think um, I, I may have listened too much to A and R and should have uh, stuck to my ground and and continued, but then I started having success as a writer, so it was like, okay, oh, I'll do this. This is fun, and um, I'm glad I did. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, definitely. I think I make a better songwriter yeah. than a, than an artist. I think career longevity too is if for a writer, you know, it's obviously the songs can exactly can, can, do, oh, can do different yeah. Yeah. things. When I spoke with you last, and I last interviewed you, uh, we were talking about songwriters in North America, Sona. Yeah. You know, obviously, a number of people have been here with us from from that organization, yeah. and we're yeah, we're very tuned into that and analyzing what's been happening, you know, legislatively you know, with the Music Modernization Act, with the challenges now presented by some of the BMUs. Is that the right word? The monster mm-hmm. corporations that have. A lot of control of streaming, and uh, you know, are fighting kind of on the on the rates. And you know, where do you see that going? I mean, do you allow that to influence you in any way, or you know? Oh, it totally influences me because it affects my business. Yeah. Sona has been such a great part of becoming a community for me in LA. I love everybody on it. I love the passion, and it's incredible what you can do when you really believe you're being wronged. It's an ongoing thing. So we're literally working every day to, we're all volunteering, by the way, as well, to fight the good fight and uh, trying to keep the rates up for songwriters, trying to change things for a new generation of songwriters. Um, And just because the MMA has passed doesn't mean that it's... It's, you know, it's a done deal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Spotify, Amazon, mm-hmm. Pandora and Google have pushed back on the agreement that they made in November. And um, we're trying to fight it. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing the Lord's work. You're doing- <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. You know, it feels yeah. very gratifying. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a really great community of people, I think, um, we as songwriters tend to hide away in our mm-hmm. little hidey holes too much. I'm really proud of what we've accomplished so far. That's great. That's great. We will continue to keep updating as as time goes by. But yeah. it does, you know, it does require a certain amount of knowledge and, and reading about it. And 
It's you know, intense. It's, there's yeah. a lot of detail there. Yeah. And a lot of weird stuff from the past that you can't believe. Right. Like, or understand. I think, yeah. I think they make these things so complicated so we can't understand. I think that too. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a lot of things that are like that. Yeah. You know? And I think the MMA was trying to help with that, I think, to yeah. a certain extent, kind of clear a lot of those weeds out of the way. More to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More to come. But this Spotify thing is <sighs> super disappointing. Yeah. I mean, I made the jump from Spotify to Apple a long time ago because Apple was yes. was was paying better rates because it's not a freemium model. It's you know it's a paid model, and we're not asking for anything unreasonable here. We sure. just want to be paid uh, fairly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely. I mean, if people knew what the numbers on I th- the numbers are, I think they would be quite quite surprised. Yeah, shocking. Yeah. A, a number of people on social media have been posting their their royalty statements from Spotify, and it's terrifying to see these gazillions of plays, you know, resulting in pennies. Oh, it yeah. is, and and you know, and and the industry cannot rely on a bunch of people that are passionate about music and doing it for free because at some point yeah. they're going to have to pay their rent. Yeah, and that. That's the only way songwriters can continue to deliver music to the community of the world that relies upon music to help tell the story of their lives. You know, without the us, there's there's it's going to be a really quiet world. You yeah. know, and um, and you know, it's it may, people may see it as a luxury, but you know, this is what God put us on this earth to do. And and that we should be paid for that, you know. But we should also teach the younger generations that, that uh, you know they should pay for music. Oh, of course, and they're the, they're <laughs> the ones that the industry relies free. on for the passion, yes. you know, yeah. because they'll do it because they're still on hope, you know, maybe being looked after by their folks, you know what yeah. I mean. So at some point they're going to have to pick up their own bills. How would people find out or register for songwriter camps? How would they find out more information about that? Uh, www.songwritercamps.com isn't that easy? <laughs> Very easy. We made it as easy as we possibly could. We're actually the number one search result on Google, actually, for songwriting camps and, and the like. So, And it's a submission-based camp, too. Yep. Ah. It's not all comers are entertained. We want people to have had a little bit of experience in terms of they do know kind of what structure is and things like that. So there is a submission process. You send music in. We'll take a listen to it if we feel it's a fit. Then, then they'll be offered a place because we, we only have thirty six places. Yeah, thirty six yeah. places. Oh, that's really good to know. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. To yeah, know. and we're so pretty close to it right now. So we've got people coming from Lebanon. We've got um, Russia, uh, Russia, China, um, Denmark, uh, Norway. Yeah, um, all over the world. All over. Yeah. Terrific. The opportunities are everywhere. Yes. Indeed. You mentioned unspoken rules of collaboration to me earlier. Can you give us one more unspoken rule of collaboration that we should know coming from both of you? I sort of touched on it earlier, uh, trusting Mm. your people in the room and sort of letting go of your ego and listening to somebody else's idea because maybe you can help shape that idea to be better. Um, It's not always about you and your ideas. Great, great. Turn up on time, <laughs> please, because there's other people that did get up early enough to turn up. And also come with a number of ideas, not just one. Come up with some backup ideas as well, because your number one idea may not be a one number one idea for somebody else. And I don't mean chart position. I mean your number one idea you think is your best idea. Come with a bunch of different things as well. So, um, yeah, just come prepared to, to write a song. Is there a dream artist you'd like to collaborate with? Oh, jeez. Yeah, right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, you know what? Right now, who would I love to write with? I would love to write with Seagreed mm-hmm. because I, I, I've been into this young artist from Norway for quite some time, and her record is outstanding for a, a young kid, really. The lyrical content is really cool and interesting and her melodies are just bananas so yeah i would love to write with her right now i just think she's right at the front edge of what i love about writing and music right now so yeah that's be one i would love to work with and also hi Sakai, i mentioned them yes. again because the girl that sings in ingrid that sings in that band is is just ridiculously good it's just cool yeah. who's your dream 
Oh my god, oh my I god. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've been <laughs> just look uh yeah, trying to trying to come up with a name. Um uh Ed Sharon, I think, it's, would yeah. be a, somebody I'd love to get in the room with. Right. Um and actually have a have a laugh with and um you know, he's he's got such a commercial ear and I love his writing. Um I'm a big fan of singer songwriters and um he's one of my faves. Pam and Richard, this has been most enlightening. Thank you so much for being our guest today on Storyophonic. Thank Thank you, you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Always a pleasure. This episode of Storyophonic was produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasic. Our theme music was written, produced, and recorded by Dusty Gray. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Storyophonic. We love getting feedback, so please review us on your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and we look forward to having you back for another edition of Storyophonic.